Thousand Yards in Baltimore. It's the California Angels and the Baltimore Orioles. ESPN presenting Friday night Major League Baseball. Chris Myers here in our studios. We'll be keeping you up to date on all the other activity going on throughout the evening. We'll send you out to Baltimore. The Angels going for their fourth straight in just a moment. First, another red-hot team in the National League, the Philadelphia Phillies, playing the Cubs in the afternoon. The Phillies on a roll at the top of the National League East. Mike Morgan starting for Chicago. Terry Mulholland for Philadelphia. Bottom of the first, Mark Grace up there with two men on. Last year hit 326 with runners in scoring position and delivers this time. Giving Chicago a 2 to nothing lead, Willie Wilson and Ray Sanchez come in to score. Mike Morgan, as we mentioned, the starter for Chicago, looking for his first win of the year. And Grace offensively doing it defensively. Getting Morandini's shot, flipping to Morgan. They get the out. Grace goes two for four. And the Cubs hang on to win it by the score of three to one as Myers comes on for his second save. Quick look at the National League games coming up. Jose Rio going for the Reds. You see later on the Cardinals and the Padres. That is our ESPN broadcast. In the American League, the Red Sox are tied with the White Sox at 4-all. Ellis Burks has returned to Fenway with a home run. Scott Cooper has hit one out along with Robin Ventura and Ron Karkovice for Chicago. And, of course, Texas, the Yankees will be keeping an eye on that. Thomas Howard, a home run for Cleveland. Jack Morris against Charles Nagy as the Jays and Indians go at it in the second. Standing by, Steve Zabriskie and Larry Sorensen with the Angels and the Orioles. Rick Sutcliffe against John Farrell from Baltimore, part of ESPN's Friday Night Baseball. Enjoy the game. ESPN Major League Baseball is brought to you by Cold Filtered Miller Genuine Draft. Get out of the old, get into the cold. And by Isuzu, makers of incredible four-wheel drives. It's Friday Night Baseball here on ESPN. We're in Baltimore and beautiful Camden Yards, where tonight the California Angels off to a great start. Take on the Baltimore Orioles. Hi, everybody. I'm Steve Zabriskie, and along with Larry Sorensen, we welcome you to Baltimore for Friday Night Baseball. The Angels are off to a good start, and Larry, it's even as though they have a lot of kids in their lineup. One of the things that Buck Rogers said as the kids are playing hard, the coaching staff said, we're really having a good time because these kids want to learn. Well, they're learning fast, and they're doing well. Earlier before the game, Larry talked with manager Buck Rogers, who's philosophical about the fact that it's still early. You really can't tell about a club until you get at least 25 uh, or 30 one, you know, 25 percent, one third of the season, under your belt, and then you start looking. You say, well, you know, we might have something here. But right now, I just like the enthusiasm and the uh, the way this ball club is uh, has gone about uh, the whole the whole situation of of winning and, and playing the game. Oddly enough, Johnny Oates said the same thing about his ball club the other night, that it's still early in the season. His club is 2-6, and six, but the expectations are quite a bit different for the Baltimore Orioles. They've got a veteran club, and Johnny has not been happy with the way they've played. So unhappy, in fact, that Tuesday night after their game against Texas, he had a closed-door meeting, which is very unusual for him. His personality is, let the guys play through it. I know that they're going to take charge eventually. John thought they needed a little bit of a jolt. He said it's like they thought it was September 20th, and they were 28 games out of first place he wanted to wake this club up a little bit more and they responded for him it'll be a good game tonight we will see if in fact they respond in a big way here tonight and they will have their ace on the mound here's the lineup that Rick Sutcliffe of the Orioles will be facing for the California Angels tonight the left fielder leading off for the Angels tonight is Luis Polonia done a good job in that position center fielder young Chad Curtis will bat second one of the good rookies, JT. Jack Thomas Snow will be at first base hitting third. Chili Davis, the leader and designated hitter, bats fourth. Tim Salmon in right field, also a rookie, bats fifth. Greg Myers does the catching and hits sixth. Rene Gonzalez bats seventh place, third base. Batting eighth, the second baseman, Damon Easley, just a few games away from being a rookie. And Gary DeSarcino, the shortstop, hits ninth. Pitching tonight, Rick Sutcliffe. He's a guy that throws every kind of pitch imaginable at you, whatever it takes to win. One thing to look for is how he does early. Last year, he was 0-10 when he gave up a run in the first inning, 16-5 when he did not give up a run in the first. And this year, Sutt has had a tough outing, his first outing, and a pretty good one in the second. A strike to Bologna, who squared around. Bologna hitting 3-10. No homers, two RBIs. Polonia and Curtis 
The Angels have some speed at the top of their order. And the third baseman, Leo Gomez of Baltimore, in about 10 feet in on the grass. One ball, one strike. Which is fine if you have a pitcher like Sutcliffe that you know that can spot the ball well. What Sut will try to do to Polonia is keep the ball in so he can't hit a chopper over, gun, over Gomez's head at third base. And he hits it well to center field. Devereaux playing shallow a long way back and makes a fine running catch. Devo went and got it. It was a human highlight film last year. That ball came a little more over the plate than Sut wanted. As you said, he was playing very shallow, so he had to go back strong. Polonia not known for his power, but a good running catch by Mike Devereaux. Here's Chad Curtis, the young center fielder for the Angels, hitting 333 in the early going with, as you see, six RBIs already. Ball one. Curtis has had seven hits in his last 12 at bats. One ball, one strike. Curtis going without the sleeves tonight. A lot of rain here today, only fortunately for everybody, it stopped about two hours before game time, two and a half hours. Tight, two and one. In all the time that we spent wandering around before the game, did you run into any Oriole employee that didn't tell you how well this field drains? <laughs> Don't worry about it. This field drains great. This is the new prescription turf. We've got <laughs> sand underneath the grass, and we got pumps underneath the sand. And the gravel, and the thing, and the thing. Well, you know, what? you're right. I mean, it really is a phenomenal ballpark. And it is playable. I mean, it took a lot of water, but it's playable. Two balls, two strikes. One out, nobody on. We're in the top of the first inning. Sutcliffe put it right where he and Hoyles wanted it. And Sutcliffe thinks he should have gotten a call, but it's three and two. Sutcliffe is convinced this is a strike. And I think he's right that to strike. Pretty good to me. My opinion, however, does not supersede that of home plate umpire Terry Kraft. The Angels sporting new uniforms. Takes something off. It's a ground ball to short. Cal Ripken in time. Two out. Cal will do that all night long. Gold glove defensively. Here is the defense for the Orioles tonight. Anderson and Devereaux outstanding in the outfield. Mark McLemore is the story. Harold Baines was supposed to be in the lineup. He got a shot today. McLemore is playing right, and Johnny Yelts says he'll play some left field this year when Anderson rests. The defense is very solid in the infield. Chris Hoyles is again behind the plate. J.T. Snow, one of the two rookies in the lineup, but not one of the youthful faces because, I mean, but one of the many youthful faces, more than two. J.T. hitting 348 in the early going. One home run, six RBIs. Ball two. The Orioles think that this is a big game. There has been a little talk about the fact that even though it is still young, this is a big game for them tonight, and they want to get things on track. Sutton really had his game face on in the locker room today. A very high, lazy fly drifting into right center is Devereaux. And the inning is over. Sutcliffe retires the Angels in order in the first. No score. We'll be back. No score as we go to the bottom of the first here at Camden Yards. And here's the lineup for the Baltimore Orioles this evening. Leading it off, off to a good start and coming off a good year, Brady Anderson in left field. Mike Devereaux, the center fielder, bats second. Cal Ripken, shortstop, batting third. You put him in there every day. Glenn Davis batting fourth at first base. The catcher, Chris Hoyles, batting fifth. 
Cheeto Martinez will be the designated hitter tonight. He's hitting in the six hole, looking for his first hit. Mark McLemore, as Larry mentioned, in right field batting seventh. Third baseman Leo Gomez hits eight. And over from Seattle this year, Harold Reynolds, the second baseman, hits ninth. The pitcher tonight will be John Farrell. He spent the last two years recovering from elbow surgery. Not a strikeout pitcher. The one thing he sometimes has trouble with is his control. You see six walks already. The five strikeouts is a little bit high in only the four and two-thirds innings. Defensively behind Farrell tonight in the outfield. He's got some speedsters in left and center, Curtis and Polonia. Salmon can be a little bit shaky at times, but he's got a strong arm in right. J.T. Snow is the big story in the infield. Ken Maka told me he's been saving two or three runs a game over on the right side. Easily is a guy that they're not too sure about at second base, a great athlete who they're trying to find a position for. Greg Myers came over from Toronto. He'll be behind the plate, and John Farrell's the pitcher. Angels trying to shore up their defense as well as serve the youth. And it's working for them. They led the American League last year in games played by rookies. So this is not really a new look. They have all these kids on the Angels. You know, one thing that Buck Rogers said was that these kids are so good defensively that he can afford to struggle with them offensively because he knows that they'll play well in the field. He said, it's not like I got some big old cow that's going to hurt me in the outfield or the infield, too. Was he looking at either you or no. I when he said that? Brady Anderson off to a fine start hitting 424 in the early going with a home run and two RBIs. He has hit in each of the first eight games this season. Ball two. Brady had a career year last year, and so a lot of people said, is that going to be it? Was that his, his big bolt of the career? In fact, he's starting off very well again, and he's for real. Two and one. The swing and the Anderson's on base percentage so far this season is a healthy 513. He's getting on base in addition to getting hits. So he's doing what he's supposed to do, leading off. Two and two. Two change-ups in a row to the left-handed Brady Anderson. That second one can either be a great pitch or trouble. <laughs> they go a long way sometimes. Inside and a full count. After the second changeup, Anderson had to step out and regroup a little bit. <laughs> and he misses that one. The changeup is a very important pitch for John Farrell because he only throws about 85 miles an hour, 84 miles an hour, which is right around the major league average or just a bit under. Watch the movement, though, on the changeup. You see Brady was out in front of it. A little bit of movement on the tail end, down and away from the left-handed hitter. Brady probably just couldn't believe that Farrell was trying to change up three and two. Mike Devereaux, the hitter, he takes high ball one. Devereaux struggling a little at the plate. Started off real slow. He's hitting 211 right now. He has driven in six runs, but he has hit in seven of the eight games. So it's not like he's been horrific. He just hasn't had multiple hit games. Get in the air to right field. Tim Salmon is back short of the track. Two away. See, there's not a whole lot of wind. As opposed to earlier in the day, it was whipping pretty good. Well, here's Cal. Game number 1,744 consecutively. 387 to go to Lou Gehrig's record. No. Noticed in the clubhouse today, he moved into seniors' lock down at the end oh, of the lock. Oh, did he really? <laughs> Cal hitting 278. No homers and two RBIs. Takes the ball. Uh, he, he told me the other day he's having a hard time understanding why 
saying his father and his brother are not here. Now, I think you can kind of understand the situation with Billy. But Cal said that he never has gotten a real adequate explanation as he puts it high in the air to left. Luis Bologna there. And as did the California in the top of the first, Baltimore goes in order. No score after one. No score as we go to the second inning and you look at part of downtown Baltimore in the Inner Harbor area. There's a ship dock at the end of that street. If you can make it out. It looks like a bit of a, a liner. Anyway, Sunday night baseball comes your way in just about 48 hours. The Pirates and the Dodgers. Andy Van Slyke. Off to another good start. Tied for the lead in RBIs in the National League. Daryl Strawberry benched recently, says, I'm not playing because I stink. That's calling it the way it is. Sunday at 8, join John Miller and Joe Morgan for ESPN Sunday Night Baseball. Chili Davis leads off the second inning for the Angels. Chili hitting 250 with a homer and seven RBIs. Five of those RBIs have come in the last two games. Just inside, one ball, one strike to Chile. I think it's interesting that Chile's looked upon now in this ball club as being a leader, the elder statesman, if you will. He's really responded to that role, and it's a new role. Fooled by Sutcliffe's off speed delivery, one and two. He's on his second tour of duty with the Angels. In fact, among Angel players, he is the leader in games played in Angel uniform. In an Angel uniform, 425 is the number. Luis Polonia is second on that list, 408 games. That shows you how that goes. Strike three call. Davis disagrees. But he's down on strikes. The first strikeout for Sutcliffe. We said he'll throw just about everything at you. There's the fastball on the inside part. Just about the same pitch that he wanted a little bit earlier. This time he got the call and it is strike three. So one out and nobody on for rookie right fielder Tim Salmon who's hitting 250 with a homer and four RBIs. Big curveball and a beauty for a strike. Salmon was selected as the minor league player of the year last year. He also was the most valuable player in the Pacific Coast League. This is the downer breaking down and away 0 and 2. Came very, very close to winning the Triple Crown in the Pacific Coast League last year. Way away, 1 and 2. While he and Snow are the only two guys in the lineup tonight for the Angels who are classified as rookies, you've got Easily, De Sarcina as young players, Chad Curtis, who are all not very far away from being rookies themselves. So they're really five out of the nine in this lineup. Darn close. Breaking ball. Hit the third. Leo Gomez throws out Salmon. Two out in the second. Rick Sutcliffe dropped down to the side on that pitch as I was talking to Rod Carew, the Angels hitting instructor before the game. I said, how do you tell these kids to approach Sutcliffe? And he said, everything comes basically out of the same spot over the top, almost everything he throws. So it used to drop down and throw that sidearm pitch a lot more, almost always a breaking ball from him, but he's gotten away from that in the last year or two. Greg Myers, the hitter, and he takes a strike. Myers hitting 231, no homers and one RBI. Well, you mentioned the real key to Sutcliffe's success right at the beginning, and that is that he'll throw eight, ten different pitches, whatever is working for him and he feels will work against the hitter. He has a, a rather broad repertoire that he's developed over the years. Very unusual, too, in that he's a guy that enjoys pitching behind in the count. Most pitchers like to get ahead and then try to nibble a little bit. He'll get behind and still nibble. He doesn't give in to the hitter, but he tries to throw a quality knee-high outside pitch when the count's three and one, three and two. The breaking ball right on the inside corner. And if you really want to understand how terrific Sutcliffe's control can be when he is on, and tonight he appears to be fairly sharp so far, 
Watch when, when we have that center field camera shot. Watch where the catcher, in this case Hoyles, sets up. And how often Sutcliffe puts the ball right where Hoyles gives him the target. Like that, outside, and there it is outside. And the other thing to watch is he missed there. He missed his three inches of the outside corner that he tried to catch, but he missed off the plate. He very rarely leaves the ball on the inside 11 inches. You go either inside three, outside three, and you stay away from that 11 inches in the middle of the plate. That's the nitro zone. That belongs to the hitter. <laughs> that doesn't seem fair. Six <laughs> inches for the pitcher and 11 for the hitter. Breaking ball fouled away. Two and two with two out and nobody on. No score. We're in the top half of inning number two. Now you might say to yourself, what about the hitter? Doesn't he see the catcher setting up out there and doesn't he make an adjustment? Well, he can. And, and the hitters or the catchers and the pitchers call it peaking. And if you get caught peaking, you get drilled one time <laughs> and then you don't peak anymore. <laughs> and sometimes you will see the catchers looking up and checking the eyes of the hitter. Three and two. The other thing catchers do is they, they'll deek you. They'll move or they'll make a sound like they're moving and they really aren't. Or they'll move and move back so that you think they're someplace and they're someplace else. Oftentimes, particularly to a right-hand hitter, the catcher will pound his glove behind the hitter's knee and then shift outside. Well, that time Sutcliffe missed and it's ball four. And that's what happens when you don't hit the target. So Myers works out a walk. That's the first base runner of the ball game. A two out walk to Greg Myers brings up Rene Gonzalez. You know, the other pitcher that had a lot of success pitching behind in the count was Pete Vukovic. Won himself a Cy Young Award that way. You get three and two on you and then throw some big slider or a big curveball at you. Something you're not looking for. Sutcliffe starts off Gonzalez with a strike at the knees. Renee started the season as a non-roster spring training invitee of the California Angels. And not only has made the club, but is hitting 300 with four RBIs so far. Just missing on the inside corner, one and one. I played in the minor leagues with Renee, and he has really pumped himself up. And I happened to see him in a hallway and kidded him about it. And I said, well, you hit seven last year. He says, yeah, and I'm going for 10 this year. <laughs> Big home, home run, run hitter. Home run. Yeah. Easily on deck. Two balls and a strike to Gonzalez. That club had Rene Gonzalez and Casey Candell as the middle infield. You think that wasn't a loose team? <laughs> Gonzalez more effective at third. You see last year his average shooting up. Recently more effective at the plate. That's going to be out of play down the right field line. Two and two. Gonzalez has shown a good eye. He has walked eight times in the last six games. So not only has he been hitting 300, but he's been getting on base. And I think the two are related. A selective hitter. One who walks usually has a higher batting average. What you have to do is remain aggressive while being selective. And that's one of the real dichotomies of, of hitting well. Is, Patiently aggressive. Patience is another thing Rod Carew emphasized. He said last year these guys were making outs on the first pitch and they never got to see the entire repertoire of the pitcher. This year we're going four or five pitches into the count. You see him. Sutcliffe comes back with that fastball on the inside part at the knees and gets Gonzalez. Two strikeouts in the inning, a walk and one left, no score in the middle of the second. Okay, the uh, first Union 400 Sunday at one. Davy Allison, the defending champion. NASCAR racing. That's a sport I don't know about. You got to be a little bit crazy to jump in there and go that fast. 200 miles an hour on the freeway, a bumper to bumper. <laughs> I just don't know. Hey, it's no different than driving in L.A. Here's Glenn Davis leading off the second inning, hitting just 194. He takes a strike from John Farrell. 
But Davis has picked it up a little bit. He's four for nine over his last two games. Run one. Four of his far five RBIs came Wednesday night. Well, Glenn's got to knock some rust off because he just hardly played at all last season, and Johnny Oates is looking for him to get back to the form he showed at Houston. Two strikes. Popped up on the left side. Gonzalez back, but Gary DeSarcina, the shortstop, appropriately makes the play. One away. Glenn has been getting behind in the count a lot and having to swing at two strike pitches, he'd rather not. Like to reverse that trend. One out, nobody on for Chris Hoyles, who's hitting 231, two homers, three RBIs. But even though he's hitting 231, he's hit 316 over the last five games. So he had a couple of horrible games to start the season and picked it up since then. Strike one. Had 20 home runs last year in spite of missing about two months of the season. So they're looking for a big year from Chris Hoyles this year. Inside. They had a lot of faith in him before he really showed that season because they dealt Mickey Tettleton away to Detroit, giving up a lot of power and a switch hitter at that. So Hoyles was well thought of even before he had the good year last year. Grounded foul, and it's one and two. Cheeto Martinez, the designated hitter on deck. Two and two. And a full count. hit of the ball game, a one-out single by Hoyles here in the second. That ball sat up there nicely. You know, one of the things that sometimes happens when you try to throw a breaking ball and it's a situation where you have to throw a strike is you don't bury it and finish it off like you normally would when you've got a pitch to waste. Instead, you just kind of lollipop it up there and throw a good pitch to hit, and that's what Farrell did. Cheeto Martinez looking for his first hit of the year in nine at bats. One out, one on. Caught the corner, strike one. Cheeto checking out third base coach Mike Ferraro to see if there is a play with Hoyles at first and one out. Hoyles is running and the hit and run was on as Martinez fouls it away and it's 0 2. Johnny Oates obviously wanting to stay out of the double play situation. The Orioles have had a horrible time this year scoring runners too. They were at one stretch they were 0 for 31 with runners in scoring position. So Johnny's trying to take a little bit of the initiative himself, get people moving around, get the offense started. There goes Hoyles again. 
Swing and a miss at a high pitch. The throw goes into center field. And Hoyles will go to third. Cheeto Martinez down on strikes. Second strikeout for John Farrell. But it's a stolen base for Hoyles and an error on Greg Myers, the catcher, allowing him to go to third. Only the fourth error the Angels have committed. First stolen base of the major league career for Chris Hoyles. He had four in 1990 in Rochester. Not much of a threat. Myers double clutched on it and then his throw sailed. When guys talk about their stolen bases like Chris, they'll say, yeah, I had two last year. And <laughs> yeah, both on a hit and run, right? <laughs> and he'll be talking about this one for a while, you sure. can bet. Mark McLemore, the hitter, hitting 167 with an RBI. Ball one on a breaking ball. Royals now at third with two out. No score. Bottom of the second. Driven to left field. Polonia. Back there makes the catch on the track. McLemore put a charge in it, but Polonia ran it down. No score after two. We don't have any crooked numbers up there yet. No score and only one hit through the first two innings here in Baltimore. We're talking about the Angels youth. Damon Easley is going to be leading off this inning. He's just a couple of games over rookie status. J.T. Snow and Tim Salmon are in fact rookies so here's some of the youth that's a tremendous building block for the Angels this year and the fact that they've gotten off to a good start has been very helpful you start off slow it hurts everybody's confidence this way the kids break in they're off to a good roll and they can build on that Damian Easley leading it off batting 304 a homer and three RBIs and he rips one right off the glove of Leo Gomez Anderson chasing it down and easily with a big turn will hold on at first as Brady Anderson did a good job of getting to it and getting it in. Easily last year in his first year in the big leagues hit 400 against Baltimore pitching. Tried to get a fastball in on him but easily got the head of the bat out before Sutcliffe's fastball could tail in. Gomez got a glove on it. Nice thing Easley did. He went hard all the way looking possible double on this. Brady Anderson with great speed got to the ball in a hurry. But Easley was thinking double all the way. First hit for California. Gary DeSarcina. The shortstop and number nine hitter. The bat. He grounds it to third. Gomez almost threw it away. Reynolds turned it nicely. Leo gave Harold Reynolds a tough turn at second. But they get the double play. That's a great double play all the way around because the ball is not hit that hard. Gomez is in on the grass. It's a two hopper, but not really hit that sharply. So he makes the quick turn. And Reynolds, as you said, had to reach across his body, but makes a quick pivot for the double play. The ideal throw in this situation is on the first base side of second base. And look how far Harold Reynolds has to reach. It will pop up. will end the inning as Gomez comes in and handles it. Sutcliffe only throws four pitches in the inning. No score. Middle of the third. If you want to go. Welcome back to Camden Yards in Baltimore. Steve Zabriskie and Larry Sorensen with you as we go to the bottom of the third inning. No score. Leo Gomez will lead it off for the Orioles, and he takes a strike. We've had only one hit on each side so far. Chris Hoyles had a single left for Baltimore in the second. Damien Easley led off the third with a single for California. One and one to Gomez, hitting 364 with an RBI. Down low, two and one. Gomez is a guy that I feel is a very underrated player. Very solid third baseman. Got a good arm. Pretty decent range to each side. Very good with the bare hand. And he swings the bat well. He'll add to that 364 with a leadoff single here in the third. Hit 
hit number two of John Farrell. And it'll bring up Harold Reynolds. Harold's really been struggling. He's, as you see, had only two hits and 23 at bats so far. Maybe this will be the club he gets going against because last year, when he was with Seattle, he hit better against the Angels than any other club in the American League in batting average, home runs, and RBIs. Gomez draws the throw. Seems like with a lot of people, there is one team that you hit better against or you pitch better against. Could be any number of reasons for it. Could be they just have a bad book on how to pitch you or their pitching staff isn't that good. <laughs> is punting and it's a good one out in front of the plate and a tough play for Greg Myers who just does get Harold Reynolds. He was the only one that could make that play. That's how good the bunt was and Myers made it. The sacrifice moves Gomez to second with one out. But the infield is dry. The outfield took some water and might be a little slippery but the infield is dry. Myers had to come barreling out from behind the plate to make that play. And it's very close at first place. Good job by Harold Reynolds. Top of the order with one out and Gomez now at second for Brady Anderson who struck out swinging in the first inning. a guy that's got his business face on usually. Anderson stepping out and getting something in his eye. year last year and the pressure was on him. He had to come to spring training and prove himself and he did. Went on to lead the American League or to be in the top ten in the American League in five different offensive categories. So he grew his sideburns longer this year. <laughs> Fouled out of play. I saw from the numbers on the screen having some trouble with runners in scoring position this year. As is his team the Orioles. Yeah you could just about replicate that graphic on everybody and up and down the lineup and in fact in the second inning they did leave Chris Hoyles in scoring position. Now they have Gomez in scoring position with one out to count two balls and a strike to Anderson. Right in there. Farrell took a little bit off of it just like he got Anderson swinging in the first inning and change ups. This time Brady took it two and two. throw him the change up because it works so well. The question is how many times can you go to it before he starts looking for it. Swing and a miss and Anderson strikes out again. He can't believe he didn't hit that ball. Big strikeout for Farrell as there are now two outs in the inning. Right now he's just got Brady Anderson a little bit confused because this isn't particularly a great pitch. It's a fastball about thigh high. Actually a pretty good pitch to hit. Brady just misses it. He swings right through it. Looked like he might have been a tad behind it. The effect of the change ups he's seen to that point. Exactly right. If you start thinking you can sit on the change that fastball even though it's only 84 miles an hour it gets on you a little quicker. Again Rod Carew said before the game everything adjusts to the fastball. You gear yourself to hit the fastball and then change to hit the other pitches. Mike Devereaux the batter and a slider down low for a ball. Devereaux flied out to deep right field in the first inning. Two out base hits are not something the Orioles have seen a great deal of this year and they would like to get one right here. Play on its second. Damian easily breaking in. 
any base hit with the man on second is an unusual occurrence for the Orioles so far. Mike Devereaux led the Orioles last year in batting average. He was their leading hitter. He hit the most triples. That's not a surprise. But he led the team in home runs and RBIs as well. That is a surprise. And partially because of that guy right there on deck, Cal Ripken. Three and oh. Not exactly what you would call the ideal number two hitter because he really doesn't have the kind of back control you ordinarily look for. More of a power hitter, as you just explained. But the guy hitting behind him does a pretty good job in that third slot. Yep. No strike at the knees. Devereaux thought that was a little low, but three and one now. Of the knees almost brought Devereaux to his knees. Farrell stepping off, and now Greg Myers is going to go out and have a check. always say does the catcher tell you what to throw no the catcher makes suggestions the pitcher is the one that has to throw it my theory always was unless you know something I don't know about the way he's setting up I'm going to throw what I want to grounded to short he's Cena throws out Devereaux and again the Orioles leave a man in scoring position one hit one left in the third no score after three we are scoreless going to the fourth inning Cal Ripken there at shortstop doesn't make many errors, and Baltimore Club doesn't make many errors, but Monday night in Texas, Cal made kind of a crucial error, and he was harder on himself. Now, he's not talking to somebody else on the field. He's talking to himself. <laughs> and this is, this is rare for him. And it was a close ball game and had a chance to be a very key error. He's more known for his bat than he is for his glove, however. He did lead the league in fielding percentage in 1990 and 91, and he won his first two gold gloves in 91 and 92. Chad Curtis looks at a Sutcliffe breaking ball for strike one. Curtis grounded to short in the first inning. One and one. hit well against the uh, Baltimore pitching staff last year. He had 324. You've got to get this guy in the ninth spot so he can <laughs> say he's hitting every spot in the batting. Is that like playing every position in the field? I guess so. A little bit of mud still out in the pitcher's area. Curtis is something of an overachiever. Started last year as an extra outfielder. Has worked himself into the starting lineup. Big breaking ball misses outside, two and two. Sutcliffe didn't want to throw it over the plate. He wanted Curtis to swing at it. Well, he knows that, you know, this is a tough guy for these young hitters to face. Sutcliffe knows he can toy with them a little bit, try and get him to chase some bad pitches. And he punches a breaking ball, but gets it over the head of Reynolds. For a base hit into right center field. So even though he was way out of position, Sutcliffe had him fooled. Curtis strong enough to get a base hit. Hit number two for the Angels. That really was a pretty good pitch. A breaking ball down out of the strike zone, just about exactly where Sutcliffe wanted it. Curtis unfortunately got enough of the bat on it to flip it into right field. J.T. Snow flying out to center field to end the first inning. Breaks 
a string of eight hitters in a row that Sutcliffe had thrown a first pitch strike to. A little bit unusual for him. I saw him pitch two years in Cleveland and one in Chicago, and he would absolutely make you crazy from the dugout. <laughs> Three and one. That Three and two. It goes back to what you said about him feeling comfortable pitching from behind. He, he liked to throw that big overhand curveball, too, on that 3 2 count. Take a little something off and drop that big hammer. Those hitters be double clutching up there. Jack Thomas Snow prefers JT. Maybe uh, because Jack Snow. Is a name from football in years past that he didn't want to go by Jack. I don't know. Pretty well known name, too. Yeah. But he goes by JT. It's just got a little baseball ring to it. JT Snow, that's a big league name. You it know, is. When he's in Little League. People are saying this guy's going to play in the big league. Yep. Well, he just drove one into the gap. Chad Curtis heading for third, being sent home. It's a double and an RBI for JT, and the Angels lead it one to nothing. JT had an interesting comment about this club. He said, we don't know enough to come in there and be scared or anything. We just go in and we're playing hard, taking our hacks when we can get them and taking no prisoners. Sutcliffe gave up a little dink base hit to right field and gets a pitch a little bit too much into that center of the plate. And JT drives it into left center field. Good speed by Chad Curtis to score on the double. And he scored easily. So JT Snow at second, his seventh RBI of the year. And here's Chili Davis, who looked at a cold third strike, leading off the second inning. Ball one. I like the Angels' new uniforms. New logo. Yeah. New yeah. uniforms. Kind of a classic. A lot of teams are going back to the classic look. Reds among them. Chile gets jammed and pops it up in foul territory. Chris Hoyles has a beat on one away. And let's go from Chris Hoyles to Chris Myers. Chris. All right, thank you, Steve. Eddie Murray who played in Baltimore for a dozen years. Now, of course, with the Mets in a scoreless game with Jose Rio, his second home run of the year, 416 of his career. Pete Shurek has that lead. 1-0 New York in the third inning. Montreal gets a homer from Delano De Shields. Galarraga hit one for the Rockies, but Larry Walker's two-run double has the Expos out in front. Back to Steve and Larry in Baltimore. Thank you, sir. Right here, it's one to nothing California over Baltimore as the Angels have just scored here in the fourth inning. Chili Davis popping out for the first out of the inning. J.T. Snow still at second for rookie right fielder Tim Salmon, who grounded to third in the second. Salmon hit 347 at Edmonton last year. I know that's a hitter's league, but that's pretty good. Pretty good. The Triple A was pretty good. If memory serves me, the guy who won the International League, there's Buck Rogers, the Angels manager. The guy who won the International League title hit like 313 or 316 in the pitcher's league. Something like that. Ball two. Sure great to see Buck healthy again after the bus accident and recuperation time that he spent. Getting his first look at Camden Yards. The bus was on its way here right. last year. And Buck missed the rest of the season. So this was his first trip. Three and oh. I think this is my favorite ballpark in baseball. Yeah, I'd say you're probably right on the beam with me. This is about as good as it gets. I mean, to have a new park with an old feel and the view of the city and all, hard to beat it. On the 3-0. 
the 3-0 pitch. Ken Maka, the third base coach, dances out of the way as Salmon laces one foul, 3-1. One gave Mock a couple more gray hairs. <laughs> Don't talk about gray hair. Well, he was my old bullpen coach. <laughs> Got to get on him a little bit. I think that's part of the audition for third base coach is how well do you skip rope. <laughs> J.T. Snow at second base. A run is in in the fourth. 3-1 the count to Salmon. Sutcliffe faking Snow back. I've seen him pick guys off with that. And, and you see other people try and say, this never works, this never works. I saw Sutcliffe pick Carl Yastrzemski off on that move one day. Ball four. So runners at first and second with one out. And it's the second walk issued by Sutcliffe. And the hitter will be Angel catcher Greg Myers. He walked in the sixth. In the second, I should say. It's hard for him to do that because we haven't even played the sixth yet. That was a case of a veteran pitcher working very carefully to a guy he didn't want to give in to. He had first base open. He had Greg Myers, a double play possibility on deck. He said, what the heck? If I put him on, nothing, nothing really lost by that. So he made sure that he pitched him very carefully. He wanted him to chase the pitch out of the strike zone. Salmon didn't. But now the double plays in order. Thinking ahead. Got to be thinking ahead. Then you got to come back and get the next guy. <laughs> Sutcliffe now one ball, one strike. J.T. Snow, the runner at second base. Tim Salmon, the runner at first. of these angels in short sleeves I guess after Milwaukee yesterday they figured this is a piece of cake <laughs> yeah, they were they were blizzard out in Milwaukee yesterday with rain and sleet and it said it was going to snow that night I guess four inches of snow just an hour north of the stadium <laughs> the game was called before they ever left the hotel now that's the way to call a game you want to call it call it Ball and two strikes to Greg Myers, late of the Toronto Blue Jays. Runners at first and second and one out. In the air to center field. Devereaux. Snow is bluffing a tag and will not go from second. Two down. Well, a reminder of the National Hockey League Stanley Cup playoffs coverage starting here on ESPN Tuesday as the Stanley Cup defending champs, the Penguins, take on the loser of tonight's Devils Islanders game. Tuesday night at 7.30, the NHL playoffs on ESPN. The guy holding a the cup there can play a little bit, can he? Yeah, I'll tell you, what a story coming back from Hodgkin's disease. Mario Lemieux, he has come all the way back. And what a role the Penguins are in. That's the way you go into the playoffs, huh? Steamroller. Two out for Rene Gonzalez, who struck out swinging to end the second inning. Batting here with runners at first and second. Check swing foul. I saw a great quote from one of the Penguins players, though. Somebody asked him about three in a row, and he said, well, all I'll tell you is none of us picked Duke in the basketball pool. <laughs> It's a good thing. I wonder if any of them picked North Carolina. <laughs> One strike to count. One and one. 
Last inning, Sutcliffe threw only four pitches. After Damian Easley let off with a base hit, Sarcina bounced. De Sarcina bounced into a double play. Right now in this inning, Sutcliffe's up to 21. 12 and a half per inning. Yeah. Evens out. <laughs> Your average. So it's half pitches that kill you, though. Oof. That also would make you crazy from the dugout when you played with Sutcliffe. <laughs> <laughs> He'll try that first and third. He wants to keep those runners close. Any little advantage he can get to try to win, he's going to get. Strike call, one and two. Little complaint from Gonzalez. Again, the sidearm fastball. A couple of different angles with his arm tonight to confuse these young California hitters. That's what the veterans will do. They'll keep changing and, and talking with Carew. You know, he was making the point that the pitcher is making adjustments. Some of his young hitters don't think they have to. Breaking ball, roll to third. Tough play for Gomez. He can't get it out of his glove. The bases are loaded with two out. That's a tough break because if Gomez does come up with the ball out of his glove, it's a fairly easy out of first base. He'd have to throw across his body, but I think that he had time. They're going to call it a base hit. Being the pitcher naturally, I think this play could have been made. <laughs> It's a tough play, no doubt about it. It's that little double double clutch that makes it hard. Better to hold on to the ball, though, than throw it and throw it down the right field line if you don't have a good grip on it. That is the fourth hit for the Angels, three of them coming here in the fourth inning. The run is in. The bases are loaded with two out for Damian Easley, who singled to left, leading off the third. Man, I felt old when I walked in that California Ooh. clubhouse today. Looking at guys like Damian Easley, I wonder if they're shaving you. Strike on the corner. Maybe it's because I am old. I don't know. <laughs> you know. The bat boys don't have too much on some of these guys. <laughs> Expect them to be toting school books. Easily does not chase. One ball, one strike. The one thing those young players are, though, is great athletes, and Easily is a fine example of that. A guy that plays a lot of different places. You see Johnny Oates trying to figure out what he's got coming up. Some action in the Orioles' bullpen. Then again, Easily lays off the breaking ball out of the strike zone, two and one. Mills throwing for the Orioles and also playing right tackle <laughs> those numbers usually don't survive spring training just outside such as trying to nick that corner just missed and it's three and one Get a chance to see how much confidence Sutcliffe has in some of his other pitches. Three and one with the bases loaded. Right back to him. And he gets out of the inning without further damage. One hit, or one run rather, on three hits and a walk. The bases are left loaded here in the fourth, but the Angels lead it one to nothing. Oreo Park at Camden Yards, the scene tonight of Friday Night Baseball here on ESPN. Steve Zabriskie and Larry Sorensen with you as we go to the bottom half of the fourth inning. The Angels getting a run in the top half of the inning to lead it one to nothing. John Farrell on the mound for the Angels and Rick Sutcliffe for the Orioles and Cal Ripken to lead off the fourth for Baltimore. He flied out to left field in the first inning. Ball one. Don't 
know how much serious intent Cal really had on getting that bunt down, but he looked at Rene Gonzalez, who was playing very deep, and J.T. Snow at first. There's Gonzo. Was playing very deep. He's about three steps shallower now than he was, and he takes one or two back. That difference can make all, that can make all the difference in the world to that ground ball getting by him one side or the other. Well, Cal's been in a terrible slump. He's one for his last 19 hits, or 19 at bats, really. Sometimes you think about that. Foul ball. Boy, that was close. Well, you want that even more. When you're one for 19, you really want that ball to be fair. Got in on him just a little bit. Drilled down the line. Boy, what a great angle on it. Third base umpire Ted Hendry called it immediately and emphatically. And I correctly. I believe he's correct. So it's a ball and two strikes. Second. <laughs> Damian Easley gobbles it up. One out in the fourth. First baseman, Ryan Davis. Cal made a point about how important it was to get off to a good start this year. He was as disappointed as anybody else in Baltimore about the year he had last year, and he did get off to a good start. He's running this in trouble lately. You got to believe it won't last, however. Glenn Davis popped out to short opening the second inning, 0 for 1. He rips one foul outside third. Keeping the ball girl down the right, the left field line, busy. California with a run on four hits, one error. The Orioles have but two hits. Look out. Right between the two and the seven. You want to go in and you want to make sure that you don't leave the ball over the plate. This is one way to make sure that you don't get hurt with the bat. Absolutely certain that it's not going to be over the no. plate. Took something off of his fastball and it obviously just slipped away from him. Can't really hurt that much because it's not really the best fastball. Well, it doesn't feel good, I'll tell you that. Then again, it's not my back either, yeah. is it? So Davis at first for Chris Hoyles, who singled to left and stole a base, but was stranded eventually at third base in the second inning. One out and one on. Easily, easily squeezes. Foul number two. Cheeto Martinez. Cheeto Martinez, the designated hitter now, struck out swinging in the second. Cheeto was not originally in the lineup tonight. Harold Baines was hitting fourth, Davis was hitting fifth, and Chris Hoyles was hitting sixth. But Harold had a shot in his left knee. He's been having some knee troubles, and it flared up on him again. And just about 5.30 this evening, they announced that he had gotten a shot. And he's going to miss the next couple of days. He's had trouble with both knees throughout his career, and Lil Cortisone is expected to clear up the left knee this time. Well, those knees will make a designated hitter out of you in a hurry. Harold can still swing the bat. You got to take care of those wheels. 
rip foul down the right field line. One and one. Glenn Davis at first, two out. That'll be out of play the other way. Still one and two. Mark McLemore, the on deck hitter. There's a good view of the stands here. Another sellout at Oriole Park. The Orioles hold the major league record for consecutive sellouts. This is, I believe, number 63. Every time they, or 62, that's every time they strike three. Every time they uh, have a sellout crowd, they set a new record. Fourth strikeout for John Farrell. Sutcliffe's pitches by inning so far. Quite a contrast. That fourth inning is a very high number. You throw that one out and you throw the low out. And then you take the average of the other two and you're right about where you should be. 15 pitches per inning will make you a successful pitcher. What happened to 12 and a half? <laughs> that was 12 and a half. 14 and a half. 14 and a half. Mm -hmm. Okay, it said half, half a pitch. I can't figure it out. That's what Danny Litwell said. Okay, 14 and a half. Gary D. Sarcina, the hitter, leading off the fifth inning. The Angels leading the Orioles one to nothing. D. Sarcina grounded into a double play in the third. Two and one. Who you may ask is Danny Litweiler. He's a former Michigan State coach, former Major League, I believe Major League pitcher, and also one of the innovators of the radar gun. No kidding. Mm -hmm. Good heavens. Recruited me to Michigan State. Well, he must have not invented the Jugs gun. His name would be Danny Jugs. <laughs> must be the other radar gun. <laughs> I think it was the idea. Oh, the idea. idea. Oh, okay. The idea. He must be a you know, student of help. pitching. A good student of pitching. Two and two. Strike three. See you later. Sutcliffe coming back with that almost sidearm delivery. It's interesting. It's almost like you heard the conversation Rod Carew and I had here earlier. Now, DeSarcina thinks that pitch misses. Caught plenty of the plate. DeSarcina thinks it must have been low. Sutcliffe gets down there at the three-quarter range. It looks like he's sidearm so, so much over the top ordinarily. Luis Polonia hits the first pitch on the ground to second. Harold Reynolds throws him out quickly. Two out here in the fifth. The other thing that Sutcliffe does is he speeds up his delivery a little bit when he drops down. He's so deliberate with the rest of his motion, you start looking at one spot at one pace, and then all of a sudden he drops down and comes at you a little bit quicker. It really freezes you as a hitter. Well, that's what it's all about, keeping the hitter off balance, fooling the hitter. Chad Curtis, the hitter, he's one for two. He single and scored the only run of the game <laughs> leading off the fourth. And I guess he just found out why he's not supposed to do that. <laughs> and by the way, remember Glenn Davis got drilled? Uh-huh. I didn't forget. Yeah. Here we go. <laughs> two out, nobody on. Little, uh... Barber time. Then he comes back over the outside corner for a strike. How nasty is that? One and one. The old school. Yeah. Well, if the rule wasn't the way it is, somebody would have already been plunked, probably. But you can't hit anybody now. Strike two. Great pitch on the outside corner. One ball, two strikes, two out, and nobody on. One out 
there again, and Curtis slaps it. Run down by Glenn Davis. Curtis is safe. Sutcliffe getting over to cover, but Davis got turned around and couldn't get rid of the ball. And Curtis hustling down there. Took part of the base paths with him, but he's safe. Well, Curtis not known as a flyer. He's got very good speed, but not great speed. As you said, the problem is Glenn Davis takes a little bit longer to get himself untangled and get the throw off. Sutcliffe had to break himself down to get ready to be in a position to catch the ball. If he gets the ball earlier, he goes a little bit harder at the bag and probably could have made the play. Davis sliding a little bit on the infield dirt that's damp. As a first baseman, you want to try to give the ball up as soon as possible to the pitcher. Get it to him early, lead him a little bit, but get him the ball and let him start looking around for first base. J.T. Snow, the hitter, it's an infield base hit for Chad Curtis, his second, and the Angels' fifth. J.T. Snow, one for two, doubled to drive in Curtis in the fourth inning. Outside, ball one. Another base hit by Snow. Curtis will stop at second as Anderson gets it back in. Snow is now two for three, and with two out, the Angels have runners at first and second. The book on Snow is that he's a better left hand hitter than a right hand hitter, and he does a pretty good job going down to get that one. Chili Davis is 0 for 2. He has struck out looking and popped out in foul territory to the catcher Chris Hoyle. Nothing, California. Dick Bosman, the Orioles pitching coach, standing next to Johnny Oates. Two out, the top half of the fifth inning. Swing roller to third. Gomez will go to first, and the inning is over. Two hits and two left for California in the fifth inning. Sutcliffe and the Orioles trail by one. One nothing California as we go to the bottom half of the fifth inning, and Mark McLemore leads it off for the Orioles. And he thought about maybe trying to find his way on. Took a strike. McLemore flied out to deep left in the second inning. Did a good job for the Orioles last year, primarily playing second base. With the addition of Harold Reynolds, Johnny Oates is trying to find him at bat, so he put him in right field tonight. Says he's going to get some more there. Fouling away, and it's 0-2. Well, McLemore has never played the outfielder at the outfield for the Orioles before tonight. 71 games in an Oriole uniform on the field, all in the infield. So tonight's the first time he's been out there. According to John Oates, it won't be the last. <laughs> One ball, two strikes. Bottom third of the order. There's John Farrell's pitch count by inning. Pretty consistent. And underneath that 14 and a half. <laughs> I know you like that number. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I didn't see any halves on those uh, statistics. There. Still looking for that half a pitch. Is that one that just doesn't quite get to the plate? <laughs> two and two. 
bottom third of the order here in the fifth. McLemore to be followed by Leo Gomez and Harold Reynolds. Fouled away again. Right field is a trouble spot for the Orioles. Cheeto Martinez and Luis Mercedes were expected to fight for it. And hopefully one of them would emerge. Sherman Obando is a Rule 5 player the Orioles got over the winter that has to spend the year with them or be offered back to his old club. But Jeffrey Hammonds is the name to remember. He's in double A. Base hit. De Sarcina tried to get up and get it but couldn't. And McLemore leads off the fifth with a single. Jeffrey Hammonds is in double A for the uh, Orioles out of Stanford University. And their double-A team this year is playing in Memorial Stadium, just about 20 minutes away from here, in the old ballpark. No kidding. The Bay Sox, the Bowie Bay Sox. <laughs> They're waiting for their new stadium to be finished. Their opener was supposed to be tonight, in fact. No word on whether they're playing or not. Well, they don't have the drainage system over there. They have here at Oriole Park. Leo Gomez, the hitter, with Mac Lamore at first. Nobody out. Jeffrey Hammonds is off to a good start for the Bay Sox, too. He's hitting 407 so far this year. Not too shabby. They, ex they expect him to go right from double-A probably here to the Orioles if they continue to have trouble in right field. Just skipping Rochester. A strike right in there to Gomez. Oh, and one. Leo had a career year last year, his best in average, RBIs, home runs. Cemented his position at third base, which has kind of been a problem for the Orioles ever since Brooksy retired. Farrell stepped off, so Matthew Moore broke back to the bag. Tight one and one. And they had that one guy that was a pretty fair player, that Desense. That's true. He hit me pretty good. But he I remember him. he wasn't here that long. No, anymore. California was where he he had the majority of his time. Well, Gomez is trying to stake a claim there and wants to be there as long as he can. Before he caught it. Myers split time with Pat Borders up in Toronto, and the Blue Jays couldn't decide which one they wanted. Finally, they gave the job to Borders. Now, this is a pitch out and in the perfect spot. That's exactly the way that it should go. He just doesn't get it out of his glove. The previous stolen base Chris Hoyles had was a pitch up and away and a good pitch to throw on, and he double clutched on that. He just didn't catch the ball. It clanked off the bottom part of his glove. First stolen base of the year for McLemore, who's at second with nobody out. And the count two and one to Gomez, who's bunning. He pops it up in foul territory, but not high enough for anybody to make a play, including J.T. Snow, the first baseman. So it's two and two. Another indication of the trouble that the Orioles have been having. A man on second, nobody out. Johnny Oates wants him to get him to third so they don't have to get the base hit to score from second. The Orioles are up to their old tricks. They left a runner aboard in the second, the third, and the fourth. In the second and the third, the runner was in scoring position each time. Right back to the pitcher, Farrell. He holds McLemore and throws out Gomez, one away. Good idea by Leo Gomez. The intent was there. He was trying to push the ball to the right side of the field. 
just couldn't quite inside out it enough to kick it over to second base. So now Harold Reynolds will be the hitter. Harold sacrificed successfully in the third. Moving Leo Gomez over, but Leo was stranded at second. One out, one on. Strike at the knee. Harold in the unenviable situation of replacing Bill Ripken at second base, and Bill, of course, almost as popular as Cal here in Baltimore. Slapped on the ground to second. Damian easily throws out Reynolds on the play. McLemore over to third. Two out. The Orioles are now 0 for 5 tonight with runners in scoring position. Top of the order in Brady Anderson, who has yet not figured out John Farrell. Struck out twice, both times swinging, which almost certainly means that now with a man on third, he's going to get a base hit. If <laughs> this guy in, they got a streak on the line, not getting the run in. He's got two strikeouts. Strike at the knees. You're saying that it's due. Absolutely. Macklemore at third. Strike. John Farrell missed most of the last two seasons with elbow surgery. So this is a big year for him. Anderson to first base. JT Snow takes care of it. And the Orioles leave another runner in scoring position. Through five. 1-0 California. The Angels nursing their 1-0 lead against Rick Sutcliffe as we go to the sixth inning, and rookie Tim Salmon leads it off. He looks at ball one. Salmon has grounded the third and walked. 0 for 1. Skied into short right center field. Reynolds going out, but coming in is the right fielder, McLemore. And Mark makes the pitch. One away. Sunday night, more baseball here on ESPN. Andy Van Slyke, one of the best in the business off to another good year. And the Pirates taking on the Dodgers. Daryl Strawberry been sitting on the bench lately. He says, I'm not playing because I stink. He'll probably be back in the lineup for Sunday's game. 8 o'clock Eastern time. John Miller and Joe Morgan will bring it to you on Sunday night baseball here on ESPN. Greg Myers, the hitter, and he gets a breaking ball, and he gets into short left center field, and Brady Anderson comes up. That's almost the exact mirror image of the fly ball by Salmon the other way. Two out. I saw John in the hallway a little while ago. the suspenders and a tie that must be on radio. It would not, <laughs> it would not, it would not survive television. Or maybe it was to be the viewer that would not survive if John wore that tie on television. I forgot to ask him if batteries were included. Man, the combination of those suspenders and tie. Warrior win. Rene Gonzalez, one for two, has struck out and had an infield base hit. Here with two out, nobody on. Good breaking pitch. One and one. Two and one. with six hits. The Orioles have managed only three. Gonzalez can't catch it. Two and two. 
One of the things Sutcliffe does so well and makes him so effective is control that outer half of the plate against right-handed hitters, which is a tough thing for a right-hander to do, get to steer the ball out to that outside corner. He absolutely owns knee high and away. Yep, and he's been doing it for a long time. And there's Hoyles out there again. Gonzalez hits it off the end of the bat. Cal Ripken flips it over to Davis, and the inning is over. An easy inning for Sutcliffe and the Orioles as the Angels go in order, but they still lead one to nothing. Welcome back to Oriole Park at Camden Yards. Mike Devereaux is going to lead it off for the Orioles in the bottom half of the sixth inning. California leading one to nothing. Steve Zabriskie and Larry Sorensen with you, and John Farrell doing a good job battling Rick Sutcliffe tonight. Devereaux 0 for 2. Looks at ball one. He has flied to deep right and grounded to short. Cal Ripken and Glenn Davis to follow. Foul back, one and one. You know the Buck Rogers has to be tickled with the job that Farrell's doing tonight. He said we're real good at one and two with Langston and Finley. He said three and four have been good for us. We're really looking for a number five. He said Scott Sanderson at three and Farrell at four have done a pretty good job so far. Devereaux grounds out to Rene Gonzalez, the third baseman, one out in the sixth inning. I immediately volunteered to come out of retirement <laughs> for that fifth spot, but. Yeah, well, Bucks had you uh, before, I think. Yeah. Uh, and he said that he wasn't that happy about it that time, and this time would probably get him fired. <laughs> so I saw Whitey Herzog in the, in the hallway, too, and I volunteered myself, and he wanted no part of it either. Well, I guess there comes a time when you got to admit it's over, Tom. <laughs> Cal tonight has flied to left and grounded out to second. Ball one. I talked to Whitey for about 20 minutes or so this afternoon, and uh, he is really excited about this ball club. He's really thrilled with the progress of the youngsters. Knows as the first base umpire, Jim Evans. Ripken did not swing. Ball two. He was saying that uh, the thing that, that he likes about it is that they come with a lot of infectious enthusiasm. And what they may lack in experience they make up for it sometimes in their attitudes and their approach. Ripken jumps all over it, but he's going to pull it well foul. Two balls and one strike. And last year, the Angels took a lot of heat because they signed Hubie Brooks and Von Hayes, and they said, you know, why bring these old guys in? Well, in fact, these young players weren't ready last year to come to the big leagues. It would have hurt their development more than it would have helped their development. This year, Buck Rogers says they're still learning, but they're ready to compete at this level and to learn at this level. And so far, they're doing pretty good. There's a big difference between being overmatched and not having a chance to improve your game. No, that's right. Glenn Davis on deck. Foul outside third. Cal fouling off some tough pitches. Three balls and two strikes. Batting with one out and nobody on. And as you can see, struggling with just one hit in his last 20 at bats. Ball four. When you're in that kind of a slump, a walk looks pretty good. As long as somebody tells you where first base is. <laughs> well, here's what's happened to the Angels over the last three seasons. These are players that are no longer there, and some big names among them. And look at Chili Davis here, third from the top on the left. Now, here are the players acquired. Look at Chili Davis there on the left. <laughs> no wonder he's the senior statesman in the clubhouse. Yeah, well... Thomas Wolf may have been wrong. You can go home again. I don't know. Glenn Davis batting with Ripken at first and one out. A very exciting nucleus of players to build on, though. I asked Buck before the game, too, you know, what's on your Christmas list? And he said, well, I got a couple of holes that we would still like to fill. But we're going to let these kids play their way into these positions and see then what we need. That was a partial list in both instances of players lost and players acquired, but the key guys. 
One strike to count to Davis, who has popped up to the shortstop and been hit by a pitch. When trying to break out. He's hit better over the last couple of games. One ball, one strike. Deep in that left field area for Davis, weren't they? Uh -huh. Rightfully so, I guess. earlier about how Glenn Davis this season has been behind in the count a lot. He's had to swing a lot of two strike pitches and for a power hitter that's not the best way to go up there. Now Davis is ahead in the count two balls and no strikes. Look for something inside he can drive. He saw the home run numbers a moment ago how his production has dropped. Over the last eight years, he's averaged 73 RBIs to go with those home runs. That number would probably be higher as you see Chris Hoyles on deck if it were not for the injuries over the last couple of years. Rip to left for a base hit. Ripken will have to stop at second as Polonia gets it in a hurry. It was also out there in a hurry. As Davis hit it hard. Runners at first and second for Baltimore and pull out. Hitting just a whole lot easier when the count's in your favor. All the difference in the world. This ball never got in. Farrell wanted to drive it and stayed over the middle of the plate. Down in the strike zone, which to a right-hand power hitter is usually a pretty good place to be, but Glenn Davis went down and hammered it. So here's Chris Hoyles, who is one for two, single to left in the second inning, stole a base, popped up to second base in the fourth. Buck Rogers looks on. A strike at the knee. Hoyles side is low. That's not a good number. That does not that does not help your offense very much. No, and that's probably the num not the only, but the number one reason the Orioles are two and six. Although they're not terribly thrilled with the way their pitching staff has started either. No, but they've had their chances and they've had guys on base. Ripton is at second base and Glenn Davis is at first. One ball, one strike to count. Chris Hoyles with one out. Now Farrell falling behind in the count a little bit again. Has been pitching all night long ahead in the count. Grounded foul outside third. Two and two. Speaking of that Orioles pitching staff, they did make a change today. They sent Fernando Valenzuela to Rochester and brought Brad Pennington up. However, that's just to get Fernando some work between starts. He's scheduled to go again on the 27th of this month. Fernando said I wouldn't pitch until then anyway, so. He doesn't mind going down and getting the work after a less than perfect outing, to say the least, against Texas this week. A high, three and two. Now, runners at first and second, and one out. Do you send them? 
In this particular instance, I wouldn't. They've had trouble. They've had trouble scoring runs. Foyles is a guy that will strike out. Not great speed on the bases. Pretty good chance for a strike him out, throw him out, double play. That's my thinking. Let's see what Johnny thinks. Runners do not go. Foyles hits it in the air to left field. Polonia has a long run. He can't get there. Here comes Ripken. He will score. And the game is tied at one. running by Cal Ripken on this play because when the ball goes up on the fastball that's a little in he wanted it away and didn't get it there it's not hit very hard but Cal's got to wait to see whether or not Polonia is going to be able to get there now at the last minute Polonia slows down he went after it hard good base running by Cal Ripken to score on that and Hoyles draws a throw even though there's a runner ahead of him, Glenn Davis at second base. They put a little play on him as J.T. Snow danced in behind him. I, I bet that came from Buck Rogers. He likes to call those plays. Former catcher himself. Try to get his pitcher help any way he can. Cheeto Martinez has struck out twice. And he takes high and away ball one. Chuck Hernandez, the pitching coach out of the dugout. Buck Martinez likes to keep a tight rein on his pitching staff as far as throwing over to first, different plays and everything put else, everything else they put on out in the infield. You saw Gene Nelson and Julio Valero throwing in the bullpen for the Angels. And part of the reason that Chuck Hernandez went out there was to give them a little time to get loose. One ball to count. Well hit to center field. Chad Curtis right there, however. He broke in and broke back and wound up right about in the position he was playing for out number two. Cheeto hit it hard. But it was an atom ball. So the runners remain at first and second for Mark McLemore, who is one for two. He flied deep to left in the second, single to left, and stole a base in the fifth. play a ball and two strikes to McLemore. The Angels really only have two left-handers. Chuck Finley and Ken Patterson. Langston. Well, Mark Langston. But, you know, and Langston was supposed to pitch tonight, as a right. matter of fact. It was a scratch. He'll go Sunday. And facing those two more left-handers, that'll be eight out of 11 games this year. The Orioles have faced a left-handed starting pitcher. Kind of unusual considering they don't have that many left handers in the line. And I forgot Steve Fry, who also. Two balls, two strikes to Mark McLemore. John Farrell, pitching in the sixth inning, has given up a run on five hits. And the only 
walk he has issued in the ball game it was a one out walk to Cal Ripken here in this inning and that is the run that has scored one to one into the gap in right center field salmon can't get it he knocks it down and now they're going to send the second runner Chris Hoyles and he will score Davis and Hoyles both score on the base hit by McLemore, and it is three to one Baltimore. The pitch was down and in where the left-hander likes to go down and get the ball, and McLemore does and drives it into right center field. A salmon goes over and he has a little trouble with the ball. He drops it as he comes up. When Mike Ferraro coaching third base sees salmon drops it, he immediately waves Glenn Davis. What happens on the throw is a little bit of the inexperience of the of the Angels outfield and relay combination because Damon Damon Easley let the ball go through to second base. Had he cut the ball and thrown it to home, they may have had a play at home plate. I thought they were going to have a play. On Hoyles. That's an appeal to Ted Henry, the third base umpire, to say that Hoyles missed third. Ted Henry says he does. He did not miss third. So the appeal is denied. Leo Gomez takes the ball. Also a little bit of an inexperience on the appeal play because they had to do it twice. The first time around they asked about the first runner and it was the second runner that they wanted to appeal. <laughs> so they had to do it again. You know players don't know the rules. Right. <laughs> Four balls and three strikes That's and it. three outs. They How much the, more complicated do you have to get? That's why you have managers, right? You <laughs> managers and coaches handle that stuff. This is play. Three runs are in here in the sixth inning. Two out. Ball two to Gomez. Leo tonight, one for two, had a single to center in the third and grounded back to Farrell, the pitcher in the fifth inning. No strike. Sharply hit the third, but Rene Gonzalez throws out Gomez, and the inning is over. Three runs on three hits and a walk. One left. After six, three to one, Baltimore. Seven yards never seems to lack, and that's fans. Forty-five thousand eight hundred twenty paid tonight. The 62nd consecutive sellout for the Orioles at this park, and that is a major league record. Steve Zabriskie and Larry Sorensen with you here in Baltimore on Friday Night Baseball. The Orioles have come from behind with three runs in the bottom half of the sixth inning to lead it three to one as we go to the seventh. And Damian Easley, the number eight hitter, will lead it off against Rick Sutcliffe. Easley, one for two, sent to the left. In the third inning, strike one. They did need a little help tonight to get that attendance up, though. A radio station bought 4,000 of those tickets at the last minute. Yep, they almost had their streak broken. Of consecutive sellouts. The big slider. The ball one, one and one. 320 now for Easley. This kid's a great athlete, as I said earlier. They're not sure exactly what position is going to be his best position. He's played some third base. Second base now. Fouls that one back, one and two. Great physical tools. He's even already hit a home run this year. Activity again in the Baltimore bullpen. Alan Mills, who was up earlier, is throwing, backing up Sutcliffe. The ball and two strikes to Easley. And a breaking ball that just misses. Two and two. And again, Sutcliffe dropping down a little bit. 
given him a semi Laredo. If there is such a thing. That would be uh, about San Antonio. <laughs> Three and two. Let's see if you usually throw about three quarters and you don't drop down the sidearm. That would make you about what two fifths or so. Two fifths and two and three quarters. A new expression. Jim Poole's a left-handed. Is joining Mills now. Did he easily go too far? No. Well, you saw Sutcliffe and Hoyles both immediately turn to Jim Evans, but easily draws the walk with nobody out. Jim Evans immediately make the call too. There was no question in his mind, but that he easily held up. Got that bat head pretty far out over the plate. Spoken like a true pitcher. From this angle, it really is going to look like a the real rule and the de definitive answer ought to be intent. If you're trying to hold up. Dick Bosman, the pitching coach, out to talk to Sutton, also buy some time. Pretty good line score for Rick Sutcliffe tonight. A little bit of a struggle lately. As you see it walked to easily his third. A lot of respect for Dick Bosman as a pitching coach. He's a guy I enjoy coming to the ballpark and talking baseball to. I learn a lot of baseball from him. Well he's certainly gotten good reviews from the people around here. His staff loves him. Yep. That's really what counts, too, is that the pitching coach is helping the pitchers. Of course, it helps you be a good pitching coach when you've got a Mike Messina to start with. That's for sure. Good play by Reynolds, and they get the double play, and a good play by Glenn Davis at the other end. The runner at first easily was going, and the ball was sharply hit, and Harold Reynolds just got rid of it to Ripken in a big hurry. Well, Ripken got rid of the ball in a big hurry, too. Well, watch the positioning on Ripken's feet when he gets rid of this. He's got that underhand flip. The ball almost hits the runner. Cal goes with the down under throw. Good turn. Second double play for the Orioles. Nice flip by Harold Reynolds and then a quick turn. Top of the order and Luis Polonia the hitter. He's 0 for 3. Gary DeSarcina has grounded into both of those double plays tonight. Both on fairly sharply hit. That's high. Two and oh. Polonia has fly deep to center, popped out the third, and grounded the second. Outfield shallow and way around the left. Where do you think they think he's going to hit the ball? Well, there it goes. <laughs> shallow and around the left. <laughs> and over there is Brady Anderson with that fine speed to make the catch in foul territory and end the end. Sutcliffe gets another double play and now has a three to one lead. Left hander Bob Patterson is a new pitcher for the California Angels as we go to the eighth inning. Or the bottom of the seventh. Remember the Chicago Cubs last year was signed by the Angels as a free agent on April 4th this year, day before opening day. Got a pretty live arm, fastball slider type pitcher. Love the city of Chicago, spent some time with the White Sox too. Good time. Especially in the sun. <laughs> Patterson has only appeared in one other game. He's worked two innings so far this year. And he's not given up the run or a hit for that matter. He has walked two. So John Farrell goes six and leaves at the moment as the losing pitcher of record. Harold Reynolds leading off in the seventh inning for Baltimore. The O's lead it 3-1 up in foul territory outside the first base bag. J.T. Snow run off the play by Damian Easley. Run away. Yeah, 
Good communication on the part of Damian Easley. That's his play. It's a much easier play for the second baseman running over at that angle than the first baseman backpedaling. Anderson 0 for 3. Struck out twice. Not a typical Brady evening as he takes another strike. Anderson's eight game hitting streak is on the line as he has hit in every game so far. And is that going to fall in? No. Luis Colonia right there. Out number two. So Joe DiMaggio safe for another little. <laughs> Cal has a better chance to break Lou Gehrig's record than somebody does to hit in 56 straight. Mike Debro batting with two out, nobody on. He goes over the green and he takes up the big ball. Debro, another product of Arizona State University. That's a serious big league. Put yourself together a pretty good club with alumni of Arizona State. Uh, if Reginald Martinez Jackson foul back out of play. Two balls and one strike. A fellow that's going into the Hall of Fame by himself this summer. Yep. Isn't it interesting that there there is no other player either from you know past years and media ordinarily you have you know three or four yeah there's a group three and one and has the veterans committee already made their votes for the year I mean are they allowed to bring somebody I think they've changed the way they do that I think the veterans committee has changed the Devereaux went too far that time, three and two. Now there's a guy headed for the Hall of Fame. You way back out there on that limb again, aren't okay. you? A heavy duty prediction. <laughs> Strike three called, and Devereaux thought for sure it was ball four inside. Bob Patterson works a one, two, three inning here in the seventh, his first in relief. It is still three to one, Baltimore. When duty so calls. Take you over to the National League. Pittsburgh Pirates and Andy Van Slyke will be taking on the Dodgers. Daryl Strawberry will probably be off the bench and back in the lineup by then. John Miller and Joe Morgan will be there Sunday night, 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific, right here on ESPN. Eighth inning baseball here at Royal Park at Camden Yards. Chad Curtis, who's two for three tonight, leads it off for California. 370 on the year. Yes, the kids are doing it pretty well. Strike called, one and one. Crowworth, the submariner, has joined Alan Mills in the Oriole Bowl passes, and the great Elrod Hendricks looks on. Fastball grounded up the middle, backhanded by Reynolds. Is sharply hit and sometimes picks up speed or gets some spin off that pitcher's mound. And we welcome all of those of you who've been watching the Yankees and the Texas Rangers tonight. The Rangers leading that game 3 2 in the fifth with a rain delay. Steve Zabriskie and Larry Sorensen here at Oriole Park in Camden Yards. Where the Orioles have come back to lead the California Angels three to one. The Angels taking the lead with a run in the third inning. And 
the Orioles coming back with a three run sixth. Rick Sutcliffe on the mound still in there for the O's. John Farrell started and went the first six innings for California. J.T. Snow the rookie first baseman batting with one out and nobody on. Here in the top half of the eighth inning. That now is 102 pitches for Rick Sutcliffe. So you know that he won't be in there too much longer. Johnny Oates had his bullpen ready and warming as Sut went out to take his warm up pitches. Todd Froworth has done a very good job for him as a setup man for Greg Olson. Olson's a guy they've been a little bit concerned about here in Baltimore. Not the Orioles, the fans. Yeah. He has not yet produced as they would hope. Two balls and a strike to Snow, who drove in the Angels' only run with an RBI double to left center, scoring Chad Curtis. Both Curtis and Snow, two for three tonight. Coming into this inning, Curtis led off and grounded out to second. Chili Davis on deck. getting to the part of the ball game where it gets very tough to get the baseball out of Rick Sutcliffe's hand. He doesn't want to give it up to the bullpen when he's got a two-run lead. Snow laces one down the right field line, but it's foul. Ricocheting off the facade of the stands, and the count goes to two and two. Really like the way this youngster swings the bat from the left side. This pitch is down and into him. He keeps his weight on that back foot very well. Drives it down the right field line, but gets the top hand out and hooks it into the right field corner. Sometimes you hit him too hard. Snow, the International League Rookie of the Year and the most valuable player while with Columbus in the Yankees organization last season. Not a bad combination. Three and two. Seems like that used to happen a lot when I catch guys hit him too hard. <laughs> Well, you're up here now, bro. Mm -hmm. Snow has fly to center and had that RBI double and single to left. Pops this ball up, but it's going to be out of play behind the California dugout. And the count remains three and two. We talked about how Sutcliffe will throw any pitch anytime, and he likes to pitch behind in the count. You got a three-two count. And he throws what he'd call a BP fastball. Not really a straight change, just take a little bit off that fastball. And he got snow a little on his front foot. When Sutcliffe is on, he's as good as anybody at keeping the hitters off balance. And a breaking ball on three and two, and snow walks. That is the fourth walk issued by Sutcliffe. And it was J.T. Snow at first with one out. And it brings up Chili Davis. Designated hitter is 0 for 3 tonight. Chili looked at a call third strike in the second. And Sutcliffe now up to 106 pitches. And he's not a tremendous amount really at this point in the ball. No, it's not. It's very good for this point in the ball game, but it's still early in the season. And even though they've had six weeks of spring training, he won't go too much beyond that. Strike one to Davis. Chile looked at a third strike in the second inning, popped out to the catcher in the fourth, and grounded the third in the fifth. Here amid all this youth on both sides, really, especially on the Angels. Got the two elder statesmen going after each other right now. Davis with a base hit, slicing it into left center field. JT Snow will stop at second. And the Angels have the potential tying runs aboard with one out here in the eighth inning, runners at first and second. I would think that's just about going to be all Johnny Oates wants to see of Rick Sutcliffe. He's checking to make sure the bullpen's ready to go. I bet Todd Proworth is going to be his call if he does make a change. Jerome Walton, the pinch runner, as manager Johnny Oates goes out to make the pitching change. Jerome Walton will run for Chili Davis at first base, and Sutcliffe will lead in favor of Todd Proworth. 
It's three to one Baltimore, but two are on in the eighth inning for the Angels. We'll be back to Oriole. Thank you, Chris. Here's Todd Froworth in relief of Rick Sutcliffe with one out in the eighth inning and runners at first and second. Froworth 0 and 1 on the year does not yet have a save. And Tim Salmon, the rookie right fielder for the California Angels, who's 0 for 2 plus a walk tonight, is the hitter. And Froworth will not have many opportunities for saves with Greg Olson down in the bullpen. He's very tough on right-handers because of his unusual delivery, the Submariner. The one good thing he has going in this situation in his career, he's allowed only 12 home runs in 289 innings starting the season. And he keeps the ball down. The strike called, and it's one and one. J.T. Snow, the runner at second, and Jerome Walton is the pinch runner for Chili Davis, who singled at first base. There's Rick Sutcliffe, who went seven and a third, charged so far with a run on five hit. Just outside, two and one. Outstanding performance for Sutcliffe tonight, and something that the Orioles staff needed. They need to get their starting rotation untracked and a little bit more consistent. into the air down the right field line. Mark McLemore, the right fielder with a long way to come, makes the catch right at the line. J.T. Snow bluffing at second will stay there. Two out in the inning. Nice catch by McLemore making his first start in the outfield. The top part of that catch was that he had to run onto the rubber turf, which is a little bit slippery because of the rain that we've had here in Baltimore. Well, Johnny Oates doing a little selective relieving. Brought Froworth in to face Salmon now with the left-handed hitting Greg Myers up. And the tying runs aboard. Alan Mills will be called upon from the Oriole bullpen. Three to one Orioles will be back. Two but classic looking scoreboard and clock here at Camden Yards. Oriole Park, the scene of Friday night baseball tonight, where Baltimore, after trailing one to nothing, scored three in the sixth. And those big innings have been few and far between for the Orioles to lead it 3-1. Steve Zabriskie and Larry Sorensen with you from Baltimore. And Alan Mills making his fourth appearance. Alan Mills in relief of Todd Froworth, who pitched just one-third of an inning in relief of Rick Sutcliffe. Control has been Alan Mills' biggest nemesis in his career. He's walked five already this year. He's got the capability for the strikeout, though, because of a good fastball. Greg Myers, the hitter for California, takes a fastball for a strike. Four and one. J.T. Snow at second. Pinch runner Jerome Walton at first. With two out in the eighth inning. Last year hit 198 off Alan Mills with runners on base. So he's very tough when he concentrates and bears down. He has a tendency to get a little bit careless, which accounts for the number of walks and also the control problems that he has. I wish you'd get a new number, too. 75. Of course, Carlton Fisk wears 72 because it's the reverse of 27 that he used to have in Boston. Greg Olson is now up and throwing in the Baltimore bullpen. Renee Gonzalez gets up to bat, and we have 75 <laughs> pitching to 88. <laughs> the Colts against the Rams. There you go. The tackle and a tight end right next to each other. Just outside. Three and one now to Greg Meyer. Tying runs are aboard. They're in the eighth for the Angels. and a pretty good rip at it by Myers. Myers tonight has walked 
fly to center and fly to shallow left. He's 0 for 2. Well, you ask yourself when a manager has two right handers throwing at the same time in the bullpen, why does he do that? Obviously, in this case, you want to throw work with a submarine to pitch to the right hander. Mills with a good fastball to pitch to the left hander. Sky to left field. Brady Anderson with the easy play, and the inning is over. A walk and a base hit and two left in the eighth inning for the Angels. The bullpen holds them for the Orioles, who lead it 3-1. to one. Welcome back to Baltimore, where the Orioles lead it by two, and Gene Nelson is the new pitcher. Steve Zabriskie and Larry Sorensen with you. Gene is the third pitcher of the night. For California, Bob Patterson pitching the seventh inning. And relief of starter John Farrell. Kind of unusual not to see him in the green and gold Oakland A's uniform. Hoping that the veteran can get his career back on track, help out a young bullpen with the loss of Harvey. Angels are looking for some guys to step forward and help some of the young guys. Joe Gray has inherited the starters role, the closers role. Nelson hoping to regain his touch as a setup man as he was so effective for Dennis Eckersley. And he'll be facing Cal Ripken leading off the eighth inning. Ripken, Davis, and Hoyles here in the eighth for the Orioles. Ripken tonight 0 for 2, but he walked and scored in the sixth inning. Nelson making his third appearance of the year with a record of 0-0. Ball one. Ripken trying to get on track prior to the walk. Oh, for his last 20 at bats. And he hits it a ton to left field. Down the line. Home run. If you're going to break out, that's the way to do it. Cal Ripken's first home run of the year, and it is four to one, Baltimore. The thing Cal does so well is he throws his hands at the baseball to get the head of the bat out. Watch how the bat explodes through the strike zone and drives that ball deep into the left field corner. Career home run, number 266 for Cal. That puts him only 27 behind Ernie Banks as the all-time leading home run hitter among shortstops. He is the American League leading hitter among shortstops. That ball was way out of here. Oh, man. And in a hurry. Easy call for third base umpire Ted Henry. Glenn Davis the hitter. Davis one for two. Singled and scored in the sixth inning. He was hit by a pitch back in the fourth. Ted's biggest problem was getting turned around fast enough to see if it was fair or foul. Good play. Down low, ball two to Davis. <laughs> Just outside, three and all. Glenn appears to be getting untracked a little bit until earlier this year, the third game of this season, as a matter of fact. He had not played three consecutive games in the field since the end of the 91 season. Taking all the way, three and one. Has had such injury problems with his back and with his neck that when he finally did start swinging the bat a little bit better, the O's didn't want to take any chances with having him do something in the field, so they just kept him in the DH slot. Sky to short right field. Rookie Tim Salmon comes in, one away. Well, they feel pretty good about Davis, so they would not have let Randy Milligan go, who was primarily the first baseman, and now it's Glenn who plays there every day. Here's Chris Hoyles, who's having a good night. Chris is two for three with a run scored, an RBI, and a stolen base. Batting here with one out and nobody on.
He's a guy that's really taken charge of the pitching staff, too. The pitchers all have a great deal of respect for the work he does behind the plate. A lot of people wondered how Rick Dempsey would be replaced here in Baltimore, and Hoyles has done the job admirably. The fastball at the knees for strike one. Hoyle singled the left and stole second in the second inning. Popped out the second and fourth. And then singled the left again in the sixth inning to drive in a run and later scored himself on a two run double by Mark McLemore. Gene Nelson working here in the eighth. And a breaking ball for a strike and it's 0 and 2. But it was that stolen base in the second inning that you know Hoyles will be talking about for the next week or so. That's right. He's expected to get an RBI now and again. Not necessarily <laughs> to steal a base. A ball and two strikes. That was, in fact, the first stolen base of his major league career. He didn't get one at all last year. Right? You'd think on a hit and run, he'd get lucky. <laughs> Catch it would drop a ball or something. <laughs> yeah. break. Going away, two and two. Cal Ripken led off this inning with a big home run to left to extend the Baltimore lead to three runs, four to one. Steve Fry throwing in the bullpen for California. Fouls it off, and the count stays at two and two. Greg Olson has stopped throwing in the Orioles bullpen, so he would then look to be the new pitcher for the Orioles in the bottom, the top of the ninth. Texas at New York, still in a rain delay. For those of you who were watching that game, Texas leading three to two in the fifth inning. Popped up a mile high in the air into right center field. Tim Salmon is there. And he has it for out number two. So two out nobody on for the designated hitter for the Orioles tonight. Cheeto Martinez. Three fly balls for Gene Nelson. The problem is that first one went a long way. said Texas was leading. The Yankees were leading that game three to two. Cheeto struck out swinging his first two times up and then smoked the ball to center field. A line drive right at center fielder Chad Curtis for another out. 0 for 3. And the ball inside 2 and 0. Cheeto needs to hit some more of those line drives because he is fighting to get playing time and those two strikeouts didn't help him at all. And Nelson low at ball three. Nelson seems to be struggling with his control and has looked back at the mound at least three times after deliveries. As if he's having a problem with his footing or pushing off it isn't it doesn't appear to be where he's landing it seems like pushing off he's slipping or something and Martinez swinging at the 3 0 pitch fouls it back what will happen a lot is that as you walk in from the outfield and your shoes pick up moisture as you're walking in it doesn't seem bad till you hit the dirt and when you hit the dirt it starts to clump up on you you get the mud on your shoes and so you have trouble as you stay on the mound and on that dirt area three and one Grounded to first. J.T. Snow to Gene Nelson, and the inning is over. But Cal Ripken led off with his first home run of the year. And at the end of eight, Baltimore leads California now 4-1. to one. Bill Park at Camden Yards. Greg Olson on the pitch tonight, his sixth appearance of the year. He's picked up two saves so far, and he is the fourth pitcher used tonight by the Orioles. Olson also blew one save, and he has been the subject of many discussions here in Baltimore. People are very concerned about him. Not so in the clubhouse. They look at the overall season, and there you see it. 36 saves last year. Three times in a row with 30 plus. Well, I don't know how you can get 
overly excited about one blown save when a guy's done that well. There's David Segui, the new first baseman replacing Glenn Davis here in the night for the Orioles. And the Angels now down by three after Ripken's home run in the bottom half of the eighth stretched the lead a little bit. We'll have the bottom third of their order up. Rene Gonzalez followed by Damian Easley and Gary DeSarcina, the three scheduled hitters for California to face Greg Olson. Gonzalez tonight one for three. He struck out, had an infield single, and grounded to short. All one. The problem for Olsen is that there is a lot of expectation in the city of Baltimore that this year that this club will compete and will, in fact, win the American League East. He has been caught up with it, and as the closer, it all rides on his shoulders. One and one. Still has the great curveball, has an above average fastball. And there is the big curve, but it's high. Two and one. And you saw Rene Gonzalez's reaction to that curve. The back and the hips are the first thing to start heading towards the dugout, and then it's, oh yeah, it's coming back across the plate. Two and one. The fastball foul back, two and two. Now, you know, closers are a little bit like quarterbacks in football. It's been said that they get too much credit and take too much blame when things go wrong. It's tough because your success or failure can ride on one pitch, one hitter, and at the most, maybe one inning. Not so with the starting pitcher. Gonzalez lays off the breaking ball in the dirt, and it's three and two. He has a success ratio of about 83 percent. He's got 133 saves and 161 opportunities in his career. I take my chances with the guy. Yep. Yeah, I would worry too much. Popped up out of play, still three and two to Gonzalez, leading off the ninth. Well, put it in perspective, one time Bruce Suter told me just before the 1982 World Series, the only thing I know for sure is that I've probably got a good chance to throw the last pitch, one way or the other. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Whether it's winning or losing. <laughs> Gonzalez sounds like he broke his bat, but he gets a base hit into left center field. Devereaux up with it early. And the Angels have the leadoff man aboard in the ninth, down by three runs. Gonzalez has hit 325, leading off an inning. So he will extend that stat with his leadoff single here. And here's Damian Easley, who is one for two plus a walk. It sounded like he might have broken a finger to go along with that bat. Easley now hitting 320 in the young season. Time is called as Greg Olson needs to retie his shoe. And there's a hat apparently that has fallen from the stands in left field that will be retrieved by Brady Anderson. You can't pull anything over on those crew chiefs. Jim Evans at first base saw it right away and threw his hands up. Now, how he at first base saw that hat in the left field bleacher area is beyond me. Yeah. Don't go criticizing umpire's eyesight. Ooh. <laughs> that's good peripheral that's, vision. Yeah, that's Hawkeye right there. Ball one to Easley. Gonzalez does not figure to be running anywhere with the Angels down by three and Dick Bosman the pitching coach out now. Down with Hoyles. This is a, hey, you've got plenty of room to work with. Just throw strikes. You're going to get one of these kids to hit a ground ball, and we're going to get a double of play. Don't get locked into one pitch, either. He's thrown a few more fast.